Oh, hello, great readers. I'm Bo Chen. I'm Nimikum. I'm Ven Chan. In this class, I'll read all of you a part of A Tale of Two Cities, Book the Third, Golden Thread. Yes. Oh. A Tale of Two Cities, Book the Third, Golden Thread. Charles Dickens. Chapter 15 The Footsteps Die Out Forever. On the Press Streets. The Death Cots Rumble. Hollow and Harsh. Six timbrels carry the day's wine to La Guillotine. All the devouring and insatiate monsters imagined since imagination could record itself are fused in the one realization. Guillotine. And yet there is not in France. With its rich variety of soil and climate. A blade. A leaf. A root. A sprig. A peppercorn. Which will grow to maturity under conditions more certain than those that have produced this. Horror. Crush humanity out of shape once more. Under similar hammers. And it will twist itself into the same tortured forms. So the same seed of rapacious license and oppression over again. And it will surely yield the same fruit according to its kind. Six tumbrils roll along the streets. Change these back again to what they were. That powerful enchanter. Taint. And they shall be seen to be the carriages of absolute monarchs. The equipage of feudal nobles. The toilet is a flaring jizbos. The churches that are not my father's house but dens of thieves. The heads of millions of starving peasants. No. The great magician who majestically works out the appointed order of the creator. Never reverses his transformations. If thou be changed into this shape by the will of God, say the seers to the enchanted. In the wise Arabian stories, then remain so. But if thou wear this form through mere passing conjuration, then resume thy former aspect, changeless and hopeless. The timbrils roll alum. As the sombre wheels of the six carts go round, they seem to plough up a long crooked furrow among the populace in the streets. Ridges of faces are thrown to this side and to that, and the ploughs go steadily onward. So used are the regular inhabitants of the houses to the spectacle, that in many windows there are no people and in some the occupation of the hands is not so much as suspended. While the eyes survey the faces in the timbrils. Here and there. The inmate has visitors to see the sight. Then he points his finger. With something of the complacency of a curator or authorised exponent. To this cart and to this and seems to tell you sat here yesterday and who there the day before of the riders in the timbrils some observe these things and all things on their last roadside with an impassive stare others with a lingering interest in the ways of life and men On. Seated with drooping heads, I sunk in silent despair. And there are some so heedful of their looks that they cast upon the multitude such 
Bounces as they have seen in theatres and in pictures. Several close their eyes and think or try to get their straying thoughts together. Only one. And he a miserable creature of a crazed aspect is so shattered and made drunk by horror that he sings and tries to dance. Not one of the whole number appeals by look or gesture to the pity of the people. There is a guard of sundry horsemen riding abreast of the Timbros and faces are often turned up to some of them and they are asked some question. It would seem to be always the same question. For it is always followed by a press of people towards the third cart. The horsemen abreast of that cart frequently point out one man in it with their swords. The leading curiosity is to know which is he. He stands at the back of the tumbril with his head bent down to converse with the Mergol who sits on the side of the cart and holds his end. He has no curiosity or care for the scene about him and always speaks to the girl. Here and there in the long street of street. Oh no. Cries are raised against him. If they move him at all, it is only to a quiet smile as he shakes his hair a little molesly about his face. He cannot easily touch his face, his arms being bound on the steps of a church, waiting the coming up of the timbrils sends the spy in prison sheep. He looks into the first of them, not there. He looks into the second, not there. He already asks himself, has he sacrificed me when his face clears? As he looks into the third. Which is a vermint, says a man behind him. The man cries. Then, a moment, to the guillotine, all aristocrats. Ash, Ash, the spy entreats him timidly. He is going to pay the forfeit. It will be paid in five minutes more. But the men continuing to exclaim, Then, Evermind, the face of Evermind is for a moment turned towards him. Evermind then sees the spy and looks attentively at him and goes his way. The clocks are on the stroke of three, and the furrow pod among the populace is turning round to come on into the place of execution and then the ridge is drawn to this side and to that now crumble in and close behind the last plough as it passes on for all are following to the guillotine in front of it seated in chairs as in a garden of public diversion are a number of women busily knitting. On one of the foremost chairs stands the vengeance, looking about for her friend. First she cries in her shrill tones. 
who has seen her. She never missed before, says a knitting woman of the sisterhood. No. Nor will she miss now, cries the vengeance, petulantly. Louder, the woman recommends. I. Louder. Engines. Watch louder. And still she will scarcely hear thee. Louder yet. Engines. With a little oath are sworded. And yet it will hardly bring her. Send other women up and down to seek her. Lingering somewhere. And yet, although the messengers have done dread deeds, it is questionable whether of their own wills they will go far enough to find. Ah. Bed fortune cries the vengeance. Stamping her foot in the chair. And here are the timbrels. And if men will be dispatched in a wink. And she not here. See her knitting in my hand. And her empty chair ready for her. As the vengeance descends from her elevation to do it. The timbrels begin to discharge their loads. The ministers of St. Galatine are robed and ready. Crash, a head is held up. And the knitting woman has scarcely lifted their eyes to look at it a moment ago. When it could think and speak. Can't one. The second timbrel empties and moves on. The third comes up. Crash. And the knitting women. Never filtering or pausing in their work. Can't do. The supposed of Raminta sends. And the seamstress is lifted out next after him. He has not relinquished her patient hand in getting out but still holds it as he promised. He gently places her with her back to the crashing engine that constantly wires up and fills and she looks into his face and thanks him. What for you? Dear stranger, I should not be so composed for I am naturally a poor little thing, faint of heart. More should I have been able to raise my fuss to him who was put to death, that we might have hope and comfort here today. Or you to me, says Sidney Carton. I mind nothing while I hold your hand. They will be rapid. The two stand in the fastening throng of victims, but they speak as if they were alone. I tie, voice to voice, hand to hand, heart to heart. These two children of the Universal Mother are so wide apart and differing. I have come together on the dark highway to repair home together and to rest in her bosom. Brave and generous friend, will you let me ask you one last question? I have a cousin, an only relative and an orphan, like myself, whom I love very dearly. She is five years younger than I, 
and she lives in a farmer's house in the South Country. Poverty parted us. And she knows nothing of my faith, for I cannot write and if I could. How should I tell her? It cannot be. My child. You comfort me so much. I am so ignorant. Am I to kiss you now? She kisses his lips. He kisses hers. They solemnly bless each other. The spare hand does not tremble as he releases it. Nothing worse than a sweet. Bright constancy is in the patient face. She goes next before him he's gone. The knitting woman caught 22. The murmuring of many voices. The upturning of many faces. The pressing on of many footsteps in the outskirts of the crowd. So that it swells forward in a mass. Like one great heave of water. All flashes away. 23. They said of him about the city that night that it was the peaceful man's face ever about there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. One of the most remarkable sufferers by the same exe woman had asked at the foot of the same scaffold. Not one before. To be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. I see Barset. And Clay. Defarge. The Vengeance. The German. The Judge. All ranks of the new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of the old. Perishing by this retributive instrument before it shall cease out of its present use. I see a beautiful city and a brilliant people rising from this abyss. And the, in their struggles to be truly free, in their triumphs and defeats, through long years to come, I see the evil of this time and of the previous time of which this is the natural birth gradually making expansion for itself and worrying of. I see the lives for which I lay down my life. Peaceful. Useful. Prosperous and happy. In that England which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom. Who bears my name. I see her father, aged and bent, but otherwise restored, and faithful to all men in his healing office, and at peace. I see the good old man, so long their friend, in ten years' time enriching them with all he has, and passing tranquilly to his reward. I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts and in the hearts of their descendants. Generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their Gorston, lying side by side in their last earthly bed and I know that each was not more honoured and held sacred in the others. So, then I was in the souls of birth. I see that child who lay upon her bosom and who bore my name. A man winning his way up in that path of life which once was mine. 
I see him winning it so well. That my name is made illustrious there by the light of his. I see the blots I threw upon it. Faded away. I see him. For most of just judges and honoured men. Bringing a boy of my name. With a forehead that I know and golden hair. To this place that then fair to look upon. With not a trace of this day's disfigurement and I hear him tell the child my. Story. With a tender and a fluttering voice. It is a far. Far better thing that I do. Than I have ever done. The end.